Hi, everyone. Welcome to Book Break with Greece Public Library. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group as well as the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group. And I'm joined as always by my colleague Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. As you know, I do the As the Page Turns and I also do the historical fiction book group on Facebook. And today we have special guest Kathy. You want to introduce yourself, Hello. Kathy? Hi, um, I'm one of the librarians here and I um, oversee programming and outreach here at the library and I'm excited to be here this morning. Yay! Um, Kathy, do you want to talk about your first book? Do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I've been reading a lot of historical fiction lately um, and these are some of my favorites. And I always feel like I learn a little bit about a piece of history that I then have to go and research. <laughs> so the first one I'm talking about today is Next Year in Havana by Chantel Clayton. And I really enjoyed this duels time um, storyline. And I always like to see how the storylines intersect. Mm -hmm. So after the death of her beloved grandmother, Maricel travels to Havana, where she discovers all about her family history, but she also unearths a hidden family secret. So the story starts in Havana in 1958, where 19 year old Elise Perez is part of Cuba's high society. Um, she's largely sheltered from all the country's political growing unrest until she embarks on a clandine affair with a passionate revolutionary. Uh -oh. Then we moved to <laughs> Miami in 2017. Travel to Cuba has just kind of been lifted and starting to go. So uh, freelance writer Marisol goes to um, her, who also is Elise's granddaughter, and she grew up hearing romantic stories about Cuba. So she goes back to Cuba to honor her grandmother's wishes, which is to bury her ashes there. But along the way, she learns a little bit about her family history. She learns a little bit about a secret that her family had. And she tries to figure out how the two are gonna mesh together and how she's gonna start her new life after her beloved grandmother dies. Nice. Oh, it sounds really good. It does. It was I, good. I love a good uh, family secret book. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Exactly. Cuba's also been on my bucket list for travel because I want to go see the old cars because they, you know, after the United States and Cuba fell out, they, they kept them. So mm -hmm. I've seen pictures that just look so cool, you know. And there's actually, she does a nice description of, because she's like, she talks about the cars and like how they look pristine and how these cars are 30 or 40 years old and yet they look. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, it's fascinating look at how when travel restrictions were lifted, Mm -hmm. what that what that idea of what people thought Cuba was and what the yep. reality of it was mm -hmm. and even still the restrictions that they're facing today today or in 19, 2017 so there might be a sequel to that book too there is yeah so yeah so the next one I had was called The Flight Girls by Noelle Solazar um, and my friend and I decided we were going to do a book discussion group virtually during the pandemic. So we choose different books to read or listen to, and then we discuss them. Um, I have to admit, I had no knowledge of the Women Air Force Service Pilots Program when I started this book. Um, but I learned a lot about it. And it was fascinating to see how civilian women impacted the war so much, but got little or no credit for it. So um, the book starts in 1941, and Audrey Coltrane has always wanted to fly. Even when she was in Texas, she had her dad show her how to fly her plane in their little airfield. She just loved being a pilot. So she signed up to train military pilots in Hawaii during the um, war, um, and she um, also helped train those pilots, but also was in the air when the bomb started falling on, um, in Pearl Harbor. And that's when her world changed. Um, she doesn't want to get involved with anybody because she's a very dri focused dri driven woman. She wants an airfield. She wants to put a hotel on it. She wants to be self-sufficient. So um, Lieutenant James Hart kind of falls into the picture, wanting her interest, but she doesn't want to have anything to do with him. But then all of a sudden he's lost during the war and she realizes that maybe she, maybe it's okay to fall in love and she's trying to figure out how to, how to find him because he's, he's missing in action. Um, so she joins the Women's Air Force Service Pilots Program. She bonds with a lot of other female pilots um, and it gives her a little bit of hope during the war that something's going to be okay. 
So she um, also looks for James when he goes missing. And um, she gives her the strength to cross enemy lines. She actually goes into enemy lines looking for James to see if she can find him. So I liked it because Audrey was self, um, she had a strong character. She was very self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And I just enjoyed seeing, like I would have never thought about this whole group of women Air Force or women pilots that helped save the war. So it was fascinating that way. Very cool. So, yeah. And I didn't know you liked historical fiction so much, so I may have to recruit you for my book club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's what it's been appealing to me lately. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've I got oh, go a ahead, historical Claire. one, too. So actually two. So There's I a did theme. not get the memo. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> we always do this, you know. So my next one is The Queen's Secret, which I am reading on Hoopla um, by Karen Harper. And it is actually for my historical fiction book club, which will be on July, July 2nd. No, it's the first Tuesday in July. So there's time if people want to read and participate. And um, I started this one and it is really fascinating. I am not sure how true to life this is. Um, it's based on the life of the Queen Mother by Lady Colin Campbell, uh, which is a real biography that we have. <clears throat> and don't try to get it because I have it checked out right now. There are many shocking revelations about the Queen Mother's, um, first of all, the mysterious circumstances regarding her birth, which is a fact. They can't decide on the day. They can't decide on the place. Um, so there is a mystery there, and she drops quite the bomb. Um, then there is her hatred and scheming about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, which was pretty much a known fact, but mm -hmm. she also has additional details about that. Um, I felt kind of like I was reading a scandal sheet, but I couldn't stop reading. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> so it's like it's a best kind. pleasure, yeah. you know. Um, and her relationship with Bertie, who later became King George. I think a lot of people are familiar with the movie The King's Speech mm -hmm. and how he wasn't really prepared. He was not groomed for that role. He had a stuttering speech impediment and she really worked with him and a linguist to get him the confidence um, to go on and make speeches because a lot of this book is about World War II and their relationship with Winston Churchill um, and how he really had to rise to the occasion um, to govern and how much of a role she played in that. Um, so she is also a very strong woman with many secrets, which she's trying desperately to keep hidden. Um, so although I'm not sure about the, a lot of times I really enjoy a historical fiction that I know has been well researched. This one I am not so sure about, but it sure is a fun read. So. <laughs> This book is available on Hoopla in both ebook and audiobook if nice. you want to read along and then jump in our discussion on Facebook. So in July. Very cool. And it sounds like um, it would also be a good choice for people who enjoyed The Crown, the Netflix oh, yeah. series, yeah. especially yeah. season one. You know, uh, the Queen Mother is in there a lot. So people loved her in Britain. Yeah. You know, she lived to be over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. So Pretty interesting lady. So. Yeah. Very Definitely. cool. Um, Claire, if your other book is historical, do you want to go ahead and talk about that before I veer like to a hard left? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You know, let's just go with the trend. Yeah. Uh, so my next one was The Masterpiece by Fiona Davis. And uh, Fiona Davis kind of has a formula going where she, A, picks a historical building in New York City and B has two storylines, a more modern storyline and a historical storyline. So this one followed that, that, um, that train and it was about Grand Central Terminal, which um, was really interesting. It tells the story of a young artist named Clara Darden who came to Grand Central Station. There was a school of art there and this is a true fact. It was actually um, started, I believe, by John Singer Sargent so in the, in the 1920s, they had this school of art, and she was one of the first women professors, and she was an illustrator. So she did a lot of Art Deco things, um, kind of like those Vogue covers that you've seen in the historical past. So in reality, she was based a little bit on the artist Helen Dryden, 
um, who ended up being the most successful women artist of that decade and then kind of lost everything because of course the Great Depression came. So and it pretty much followed that, that storyline. Um, so of course in her life there's a love triangle. She has a aristocratic, um, very much supportive who kind of launched her career who should be her logical choice, but of course she's drawn to this wild, eccentric, bohemian artist who is another instructor at the school. So I'll not give you any spoilers there. Um, the modern story is about a lady named Virginia Clay who um, recently had breast cancer. Her husband, who was a prominent attorney, um, unceremoniously ditched her so she is struggling with divorce, um, a young daughter who is about her first semester of college, who's not sure what she wants to do with her life. So she's got a lot of things going on, this poor woman, and she has to support herself. So she takes a job at the Grand Central Terminal in the 1970s. By now, this beautiful building is in a state of disrepair. Um, she comes to learn about it, love the history, uh, Jacqueline Onassis pops in because she's one of the people that advocates for saving um, and preserving these historical buildings in New York. So, um, so yeah, that it, you know, both the stories were pretty interesting to me in this one, both the historical one and the more modern uh, preservation aspect. Nice. That's always tricky. Like, I've been reading also a lot of the sort of two storylines, historical fiction, like a modern and a historical storyline. And there's almost always one that I'm like, let me just get through this chapter so I can get back to the story that I'm really interested True. in. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to find one where they're both sort of equally compelling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, okay, so now that we've talked about many historical fiction books, um, like I said, we're going to take a hard left. <laughs> um, so I moderate the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group, which has only been going, so we started during quarantine. So we've read three books now and discussed them, um, but it's gotten me back on a fantasy kick. Um, so both of my books are fantasy, and they're both kind of dark fantasy, although slightly um, different. So the first one is Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Um, and this one, I listened to the audio on Libby, I believe. Um, but so this is, um, I would call it urban fantasy. Um, it's set in present day in New Haven, largely. Um, in and around Yale University. So the basic premise of the book is sort of where it, the fantasy part comes in. And so Yale in real life has all of these um, secret societies. Um, so there's mm -hmm. Skull and Bones and Lock and Key. And, you know, I think um, George Bush, like George W was a member of one of these while he was there. Um, so that's a real thing. Um, but in the book, um, each of these secret societies actually um, practices magic. Like each one has a different kind of magic that they do. Um, and it's not like public knowledge, but it's um, a thing that is happening kind of underground at Yale. Um, and the ninth house of the title, so there are eight of these secret societies. The ninth house is one that was established kind of as a watchdog group to keep an eye on the secret societies and make sure they're not um, abusing their powers and, you know, that kind of thing. So our protagonist is Alex Stern. Um, she has had, we gather, a very rough childhood um, that ended with um, addiction. She was kind of on the streets um, and she's involved in some kind of just horrific event, like we learn at the beginning, her best friend is dead. Um, something clearly extremely terrible has happened, but we don't get the whole story. That sort of unravels bit by bit as the book goes on. Um, but she gets recruited while she's in the hospital recovering from whatever this trauma was 
um, she gets recruited to come to Yale to be part of this ninth house. Um, she's clearly got some kind of um, supernatural ability or awareness. Again, we learn a lot more about it as the, the book goes on. Um, but someone has discovered this and they recruit her to come and join Ninth House. So there's um, a mystery. There are several mysteries. There's a mystery of sort of Alex's past and what her abilities are. And there's also um, a couple of other mysteries sort of seeded through the book. Um, I found it a really fast paced read. Um, the author does a great job of like giving you enough little crumbs to keep you hooked, but without giving the ending away. So there were some parts of it that I had sort of figured out, but a lot of it at the end, there, you know, some big revelations and I was like, not prepared. <laughs> um, and then it's definitely set up for additional sequels. Um, this one came out in just last year, I think. I'm checking the, the title page now. Yeah, came out just last year. So I'm going to have to keep an eye out for the next book. But um, so Urban Fantasy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, is that a teen book? Because I know she has teen um, um, series. We have her shelved just in adult, at least this one. An okay. adult. Um, I would say it's definitely got some crossover appeal, particularly because the main characters are all college age. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely gritty. Like there's some darker content, which is probably why it ended up in adult instead of teen. Um, but I could definitely see teen readers picking that one up and enjoying it. It might be some of the teen readers that liked her a lot because I remember mm -hmm. her having very popular series that yeah, are now like I say? new adults. You know? Yeah, um, oh, so okay. she also wrote Shadow and Bone yeah. and Six oh. of Crows. Yep. So those are both, yeah, popular teen books. Yeah. So, um, and then my second book is The Boatman's Daughter by Andy Davidson. Um, and this one is another, again, dark fantasy, but this one is set um, in the bayou of Arkansas um, on the oh. Texas border. I was going to say, Claire, this is, this is <laughs> the one for you. Yeah. <laughs> Southern yeah. book. Um, and this one, I like, so I'm that far from the end. I'm almost done with it. And all I want to do is finish this book. It is such a page turner. Like I can't put it down. Um, I've torn through it in like two or three days. Um, oh, wow. But this one, so it's set more or less present day. It's not super clear. Um, but it, again, it starts out with a bang. There's kind of a set piece at the beginning. There's a dark and stormy night. Um, so our main character is Miranda. Um, and there are many allusions to Shakespeare and the Tempest and that kind of thing. Um, so Miranda and her father, Miranda is 11 at this time, are, um, they live right on the river, right on the bayou. They're in a boat. They're going to run some kind of errand. We don't quite know what it is. Um, there's a storm, her father sort of disappears, she goes after him, and like unexplainable things happen. So there's kind of um, magic and otherworldliness right from the very beginning. Um, but this um, whole, almost like a little prologue, ends with um, Miranda's father, we're assuming he's dead, she hears shotgun blasts in the distance, she can't find him, she finds something else, that I'm not going to spoil, but it ends up being a huge plot point. Um, so then the rest of the book, we flash forward about um, 10 or 11 years. So Miranda's now a young adult. Um, and she is an orphan at this point. She is making her living, um, essentially smuggling up and down the river, um, running drugs, um, we assume, um, but just kind of squeaking by. Um, but in addition to Miranda, so there's um, a witch who lives in the woods um, and there's some elements of Russian folklore and fairy tales in there. So there's Baba in the woods. Um, there's a crooked sheriff. There's um, a crooked preacher. 
there's a dwarf, there's uh, wow. like a motorcycle gang, like there's all of these characters. Um, well, you are in the Ozarks after all. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. A whole cast of characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it really is um, like a fairy tale. Um, so Miranda, um, the rest of the action takes place over like two or three days, the whole book. Um, and the people that Miranda is smuggling for um, tell her she has three last runs and they're done with her. Um, and something happens on the second run that kind of changes everything and she has to make some really hard decisions and decide where her loyalties lie um, and everything falls apart. Um, <laughs> everything falls apart. And you, I'm like, how does it end? How does it end? Um, so, but it's very good. So, um, again, the boatman's daughter, very, very dark, um, but really good. And I think anyone who read um, the Suki Stackhouse books by Charlene Harris would actually probably like this one. It's a little bit darker, a little more literary, but it's got kind of the same um, like southern oppressive heat, like magical creatures um kind of air of menace feel to it that hi all sorry about that we had some issues with our wi-fi unfortunately so our recording cut out before we were quite done um, but i just wanted to say thank you all for joining us this week um, we're going to be off for a couple of weeks but we will be back on july 15th so i hope we'll see you all then and until then happy reading